Hello friends, my name is Ryan Coates. Welcome to my session, Automation++, Building an Enterprise API Economy from Scratch. Let's get started. So a quick, talk, a quick intro about this session and what it is and what it is not. Uh, it is not a session about um, taking your loose PowerShell scripts, Python scripts, and wrapping them up to become APIs. It's not about, you know, HTTP servers in PowerShell, and it's not about, you know, how to use libraries and frameworks to create APIs. Uh, obviously, that's a very broad set of subjects, and there's a lot of uh, detailed information out there that you can follow for those specific things. This is really about how you take APIs that you're currently working on or things that you've automated, uh, and how do, you, how do you address that at an enterprise scale? What, what kind of challenges do you face? What kind of things should you think about that as an individual contributor you might not have thought about before? So we will be talking about design-first API development. We'll be talking about standards and practices for scaling to an enterprise level. We'll be talking about uh, docs as code or docs like, like code. And we'll be talking about an overall developer experience and what your consumers expect out of your API economy. So uh, in the introduction, we'll talk about what is an API economy. Uh, we'll talk about API contracts, and then we'll do a quick demo of creating an API specification file. Uh, we'll go into developer experience and APIs at scale. We'll do a demo on reference pages and how to create API reference documentation. We'll talk about normalization and gateways and what they provide to us. And then we'll talk about developer portals in general and what kind of capabilities to expect from those. We'll then go into some of the pitfalls, things like governance styles and lifecycle considerations and why understanding what those pitfalls are upfront can save you a lot of headaches in the long term. And then we'll go into a kind of QA session at the end of that. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get cracking. All right, so what is an API economy? Um, so I found this, uh, this was on the MuleSoft website and it's attributed to a uh, distinguished analyst at Gartner. Uh, the API economy is an enabler for turning a business or organization into a platform. I kind of want to talk about that part. Uh, the rest you can <laughs> read read at your leisure. Uh, really, that's what an, an API economy is really. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a business strategy. It's like, how do we take a lot of our capabilities that are currently maybe serviced by tickets or phone calls or you know other kind of high touch kind of processes, how do we turn that into something that's self-service and extensible so that the business and the business kind of users can evolve over time to exactly what they need? Now, you take a look at things like cloud and no code over the last few years, and it's clear that Users want self-service. Users want to be able to solve problems themselves. They don't want to go through lengthy processes and approvals without, you know, unless they're absolutely necessary. And part of building an enterprise API economy is, is about surfacing some of that business proce process and some of that, you know, business capability, business data, all this kind of stuff that we've got in silos. It's about surfacing that in a unified way and allowing those, uh, you know, consumers to start building, building capabilities on top of that platform, right? And, and later down uh, here, it, it talks about turning, you know, like I said, that turning that organization into a platform. And that's really what APIs are, right? So APIs ultimately are consumed by other folks building applications and capabilities on top of them, right? So they're not, they're not necessarily applications by themselves. They, as a collective, are, you know, are a platform that you can build upon. So now let's talk about contracts. So one of the key things of an API, and again, that kind of platform concept, is that this idea of a contract, okay? So for me to call an API, I have an expectation that when I called it yesterday with a certain request, it returned a certain set of data back. If I call it again tomorrow and the day after and the day after, I would expect to get the same response back again and again and again, unless the underlying resource had changed, in which case, you know, maybe I'm getting a slightly different, um, you know, resource model back. But ultimately, you know, when I call an API, I, I expect it to work. Now, when I build tools and capabilities on top of that for other business users, that becomes even more critical. Now, one of the ways we can help enforce and encourage that behavior is through the use of open API specification files. And these are, these are just documented descriptions of the API surface. Um, you know, OAS is kind of an evolution to, you know, some of you are potentially uh, familiar with the term Swagger. So Swagger was kind of what they call OAS 2.0, uh, and it was uh, donated to, you know, well, I think I think SmartBear helped form this open API initiative back in 2016. Uh, it's kind of part of the Linux Foundation, and that was kind of with the release of OAS 3. Uh, 3.1, I think, was just released uh, earlier this year. So, you know, some evolution there to what is and you know, 
can and cannot be done with the spec. Uh, the spec is can be written in YAML or in JSON. Uh, they're both interchangeable, obviously. And from that single file, if it's well formed, you're able to generate documentation as code, uh, you know, code scaffolds, um, you know, for various libraries and frameworks, as well as uh, tests, contract testing, automatic kind of you know functional testing, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of value from having that spec written. Uh, and again, from a user perspective, being able to understand that contract and understand if and when it changes um, or is going to change, you know, that's that's a critical kind of thing to enable enable kind of customer satisfaction. So let's go into a quick uh, demo and we will talk about we'll talk about what that actually looks like from a consumer perspective, um, how to author kind of an open API spec. Uh, we're going to use a tool called Stoplight Studio and I'll get into that now. All right, so this is the kind of landing interface for Stoplight Studio. Uh, Stoplight Studio is a kind of graphical uh, open API specification editor, um, and we've got an existing project here that we're just gonna go ahead and open up. Now here you can see I've got a couple of API files already defined, as well as some, uh, some, some models, both JSON, schema, and YAML files. So let's go ahead and take a quick peek at some of those. So this is our uh, demo API one, and I'm just using the sample kind of code that comes with this. I'm not, not creating my own API here. Uh, if you go ahead and click up here on the code button, you can see this in all of its YAML glory, which I'm sure is always much preferable to edit, right? Uh, the reason we like this tool specifically is because it, it kind of moves the API design process out of the hands of uh, developers. And, and what I mean by that is if I give a BA or a product owner you know, this, this YAML expectation, um, you know, I'd get a lot of uh, frustration, <laughs> shall we say, much like uh, most of us have frustration with YAML on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, we use it regularly. Uh, the, the graphical interface allows me to, uh, you know, to have business analysts, product owners, non-technical people who might, you know, might, might understand the customer needs a little better, uh, out there collecting this data and starting the process of designing an API, right? So, so again, for us, we consider the design of an API a broad skill set, not necessarily a specific technical skill set. So this is the root of the API. It's kind of high-level information about the API. Uh, it's kind of servers that are you're publishing, contact details, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, obviously, as you, you drop down into paths, you start to see, you know, how I how I can go and create the different types of methods um, for for various API kind of requests and responses. So, you know, if you look here, this is a this is a user's with a user ID path, and this is going to return a 200 or a 404. And if it returns a 200, there'll be a, a body, which is up here on this uh, get user model. It will return a model that looks something like that. So, again, this is really just defining what that kind of contract looks like. So why don't we start from, why don't we actually go ahead and create a new API and kind of get a feel for what that would be like. So I'm going to click new API here. I'm going to call this demo API 3, if I can type. All right. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff kind of, you know, there's just the, the kind of uh, boilerplate stuff here. Uh, we could go ahead and delete some of these and create our own ones. Uh, maybe we want a... Maybe I want to create a new path called, I don't know, let's say we have a resource called scripts. And we have a get there. Now a get on a resource endpoint like this is generally a list get, so it's going to return a list of objects. Uh, and then what I can do here, I can go create a new path, say scripts. Script ID like that. And that's going to give us more of an individual type response. That's normally how a RESTful, archi uh, RESTful API is architected. Um, so as you can see, you can kind of just go and build up these things. And then, you know, let's go here. We'll click here. We'll say, okay, I need a response 200. I need a response 404. And again, these are just uh, these are just examples here. One of the cool thing about the tool here, it has a built-in linting and mock capability. So if we look here, now this is this is a default um, linting setup. It's not it's not my own custom one. I haven't haven't added custom rules here. This is just the out of the box experience. But it's telling me all the things it expects from a, a well structured API document. It's giving me a lot of warnings here, saying, hey, you should have done this. You haven't done this. Um, if you had custom rule set, you know, you could define at an organization level that that's an error, not a warning. And so, you know, it'll throw back red error messages. Uh, we also have the ability to create mocks. So if I, if I look here at this mock endpoint, 
Okay. Um, we've already kind of got a mock server running in the background that users can actually, well, you, you as a developer, this is local, uh, can hit and actually test the request response type patterns. You know, you can point Postman at it, you can point PowerShell or curl at it, and you can actually start to get uh, examples back. And again, if we go up to some of our other ones here that are a little more fleshed out, um, you know, these ones actually have example example returns and things like that. Uh, so I could hit these endpoints and I'd actually get get that response data generated in, in Postman or, or my script response or something like that. So, you know, this this lets uh, this lets us design our APIs up front and get a feel for customer feedback kind of immediately. You know, is this what the customer and the stakeholder asked for? Is it not what they asked for? And we haven't even written a line of code yet. Uh, this is us just designing that kind of structure. And the great thing about this is once we have that kind of buy-in from the stakeholder, we can then use other tools in the open API space to do things like code scaffolding, documentation, that kind of stuff. So this is my quick demo into uh, editing and managing an open API specification file through Stoplight Studio. Um, like I said earlier, it's a YAML file. You can do this through VS Code. You can do this through your you know, Notepad++, however you enjoy editing YAML files. I would say at scale, editing the YAML files can be a little, little painful and a little tricky. Uh, as we all know, I think in the in the DevOps space. So uh, you know, yeah, use whatever tool makes sense for you. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's uh, Open API Studio. Thank you. All right. Well, we have our first demo down. Let's continue on. So I want to talk a little bit about developer experience now. Uh, most of you here are probably developers, infrastructure developers, you know, actual application developers, you know, whatever whatever takes your fancy. But you've likely had to consume APIs before, whether in your scripts or, you know, building in them into your application or whatnot. Now, there's something I think most developers have come to expect with good APIs, and that is great documentation and, more importantly, accurate documentation. Um, I've I've used plenty of ugly documentation portals, but if the if the specs are accurate, if the detail I need is correct, then I'm I'm not too too much complaining. Uh, we also expect APIs to be predictable, and what that means is, if I'm using a suite of APIs, say the AWS API footprint or the Azure API footprint, there's a certain expectation I have that when I move from say the S3 API to the EC2 API, that there are certain things that are going to behave the same. The name property means the same thing. An ID is potentially the same data type, right? These are kind of things that I, I as a developer expect. It means the investment I make in one of your APIs pays off when I start using all of your other APIs, right? That makes them easier for me to consume. And the same uh, it goes for API uh, explorability, right? So I want to be able to you know, as an API consumer, I want to be able to kind of self-discover other APIs, other endpoints, other parts of your system through, you know, things like links provided in returns or just general detail provided in return objects. I want to be able to kind of go down that rabbit hole and find more and more capabilities that you're exposing to me, even if I wasn't thinking about them on day one. All right, so let's quickly go into a jump into our next demo. And this is around publishing an API document like the one we just created uh, into uh, some kind of reference page. Now, again, there are offline tools to do this via CLI. You can do this in your pipelines. You can create just loose HTML files that you can throw up in a S3 bucket or some blob storage. You could build them into your own website if you wanted. Uh, I'm going to use a, a tool uh, we use called Redocly, uh, which is going to kind of help me automate that process and keep it up to date always through, uh, through kind of a GitHub plugin. So let us jump into that now. So in this demo, I'm going to take the API spec we created earlier, and I'm going to add it to my API registry, which is uh, currently hosted by Redocly. Um, so let me just log in here. Should take care of itself, I hope. All right, so Redocly, uh, so those of you familiar with open API specs may have heard of um, Redoc or the Redoc CLI, uh, tools like that. What Redocly does is they basically, uh, they handle a lot of the documentation kind of requirements around open API specs. And their product is basically around being able to publish those as reference documents and developer portals, which we'll go into a little more later. Uh, so here you can see I've got my first two APIs that are already published. So if we were to click here and we can actually go and navigate to our URL here. So this is just an example of some API reference documentation that's been turned into an HTML kind of page. And, and those of you who are familiar with using APIs have probably seen these types of uh, pages on 
you know, developer portals such as like Amazon or Azure, Twilio, that kind of thing. Uh, here we've got some code samples, right? We, uh, we've got the try it button, which uh, my specs aren't actually wired up for that. So you'll notice they've just got the local host server, which is the only one I included. Um, but the code samples on the requests and responses are all available here. So you can get an idea for what the expectation is as a developer, what you're writing against, right? So to create a new user, I need to send these fields and this is what that's going to look like in Go. And this is what my responses may look like. Right? So let me show you how to wire that up for a, a net new spec. So we'll click Add API here. We'll call it Demo API 3. Now I'm going to wire this up to GitHub so that this continually takes care of my uh, spec um, based on you know CICD type model. Now if I've done this right should see spec three as an option. There we go. And I'm just gonna include all the other assets just in case. Now, for those of you not using a product like this, uh, Redocly themselves still maintain their open source uh, tool set. So you can actually just uh, run a CLI tool that will take your spec and create an HTML uh, bundle for you, which you can then host yourself, uh, either in your own site or S3 buckets, that kind of thing. Uh, so we're going to go ahead, we've created the registry item here, and uh, now we're just going to go ahead and click Create Reference. And I'm going to leave those blank. All right, so this is uh, this is already published, apparently. Let's go take a look. Oh, you know what? Let's go and make it public. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. All right. Uh, now you remember we were messing around with this, so our endpoints were actually for scripts. Uh, so again, I didn't update a ton of the, the documentation while we were working there, but if we look at um, this one here, yeah, we've got script and script ID, uh, which was the, the new kind of endpoint we created when we were messing around earlier. Uh, so again, there's not much here, but this is really just to demonstrate how easy it is to get these kind of things published and documented. And that allows uh, your users and consumers to start you know, writing against these things very quickly. And again, this stays in sync with my spec. So if I make changes to my spec right now, if I go back into Stoplight and I make some changes and I push that back up to GitHub, this is going to resync and, and re redeploy and you're going to have all the latest kind of changes and stuff ready to, ready to go. So... Uh, that's how to you know turn your spec into some simple documentation and how to get it hosted on a platform like Redocly. It's very straightforward. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it leave it there. Thanks. So now we're through with that demo, let's get straight back into some of the more uh, kind of how to deal with APIs at scale. One of the things I want to talk about is normalization. Uh, you could call this standards, governance, whatever, but uh, one of the things when you're dealing with multiple APIs, especially ones that have been built up uh, through different teams at different points in time, is that they're very likely to have completely different input and output expectations. Um, and what I mean by that is different request bodies, different property names, you know, all that kind of thing. Different, different meanings of the same property name, right? So we talked about that a little a second ago. Um, these are the type of things you really want to start normalizing on to have an enterprise API economy. Um, and so this can be done through kind of API standards, guidelines, uh, style guides, uh, whatever really makes sense for your organization. But what you want to do is start coming up with uh, a standardized request and response bodies. This makes client side work significantly easier. A good example of this is uh, things like standard error bodies um, or standard problem messages, that kind of thing. Uh, also standard uh, request and response metadata things that consumers can just assume they will get with every request so that they can handle that kind of once and, and deal with it regardless of what API they're calling. Uh, consider your resource hierarchy carefully. So one of the things with RESTful APIs is around kind of a resource hierarchy. So so part of the REST architectural pattern is everything is, well, not everything, but, but most things are a resource. And a resource generally has a kind of span of control, a span of kind of, you know, significance. And you want to make sure that things that are 
underneath that, so let's use cloud as an example, I may have a cloud account, and that may be a resource. And under that cloud account, I may have VMs and individual VMs at that. A VM itself doesn't belong to more than one cloud account, so that's a kind of hierarchy. So if I was to navigate to that, and again, those of you who are using AWS or uh, or Azure are probably familiar with the way the hierarchy works. Uh, you know, your URL pattern will be subscription ID forward slash you know, VM ID or something like that, right? Uh, so be mindful of those and also kind of keep an eye out for things like circular dependencies. When you do have something that can belong to multiple things above, now can I go to, you know, account forward slash VM forward slash account two? Because, you know, those are kind of things that'll, that'll catch you out and you want to you be mindful of those. Again, this is kind of specific to kind of that REST style architecture. If you're doing different, you know, standard HTTP APIs, this may not be a concern of yours. Uh, and if you're doing newer GraphQL type Type APIs, again, there are different ways that, that hierarchies work in GraphQL. Uh, another important thing is to create a shared vocabulary. And this goes back to things like property names and things like that. So if I go to API endpoint one and there's a name field and it's maybe the name of a VM, and I go to a different API endpoint and there's a subscription field or a subscription name field, I, I don't necessarily want those things to be different property names. If name means, you know, a, you know the name of an object, I would expect name to be the same across those surfaces, right? Same with ID. If ID is a GUID here, ID should probably be a GUID somewhere else unless you've got a good uh, good reason for it not to be. And if there's a good reason, maybe you shouldn't be using ID as the property name. Have a think about that because a shared vocabulary, once again, really makes it easier for your consumers to explore your API surface uh, and the investment they make in one API kind of carries over to all those other APIs. So it's really important that you kind of get that kind of stuff normalized. And again, if you're starting to enforce that through standards and governance, you can use things like linting tools to say, hey, you're not meeting our vocabulary standards, fail, uh, and, and break builds and things like that. So linting tools are really powerful to help you kind of enforce that. All right, so gateways are another thing. Um, so gateways, uh, and, and I'll let's be clear here. When I'm talking about API gateways, I'm talking about... Uh, the big chunky ones, right? So an API gateway kind of akin to an enterprise perimeter firewall. So not, you know, for those of you who do AWS Lambda, you'll you'll know that AWS has a concept called API gateways. These are very much kind of uh, HTTP triggers for Lambdas. You can't have a Lambda with an HTTP trigger without things like their API gateway. It's a very kind of sidecar patterned gateway. Um, and those are great if, if that's the only kind of thing you're dealing with. But for those of you who have things in AWS, things in Azure, things on premises, you know, having a kind of, you know, kind of monolithic gateway in front of all of those things makes a lot of sense because your gateway is really where you're allowed to start putting a lot of application control, authentication standards, data collection, logging, that kind of stuff. You also can inject uh, logic into your request and responses. So you don't necessarily want that to be done in four or five different places because you have four or five different platforms. Um, and, you know, you want to be able to standardize that. It also kind of helps to standardize your URL patterns as well because if you have a single gateway, you likely have a single ingress point. Uh, that handles routing and kind of authentication for your for your APIs, and that gives your consumers a single endpoint to kind of consume. So, uh, have a think about that. There are a lot of gateways on the market, different styles, big old school monolithic ones, little sidecar ones that can sit next to your Kubernetes pods and things like that. It really just depends on what what kind of architecture you have behind the scenes for your APIs. And I think for most enterprises, you're going to find that there's a you know fair mix of um, of styles and, and application development practices rather than like a single you know standardized approach, right? So I'm going to jump into another demo, uh, and we're going to talk about developer portals in general. So what we saw earlier was uh, individual API specs, and we saw those specs turned into uh, reference documents. A developer portal is kind of more of an all-encapsulating kind of where do I collect all these reference docs for all of my APIs? Where do I collect user documentation and walkthroughs and guides, and how do I get that all published in one place? So again, there are some open developer portals out there, um, you know, open source. Uh, you also got ones that come with certain API gateways. Ways. So if you had Apogee, for instance, there's a portal built in. If you have MuleSoft, there's a portal built in. Uh, once again, I'm going to go back and demo something from Redockly. That's the developer portal I use day to day. Um, and so I'm a little familiar with it. And again, you know, pick, pick the right one for you guys. Um, but yeah, developer portal is a really important place for, you know, your consumers to come to, you know, one kind of landing page and get all the information, get all the, the reference things, get all the authentication styles, all those kind of stuff. And, you know, again, those of you who are using APIs today, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen, you've seen APIs that are poorly documented and you've been to some of the good 
developer portals, you know, again, the examples I mentioned earlier, Twilio, uh, Microsoft Docs, uh, you know, Citibank. I think there's a, there's a lot of really great uh, API documentation portals to, to glean from. Um, and and uh, yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll walk through a kind of quick example of that now. So back to my Redocly portal um, or admin portal, you'll notice there is this portals tab here. Um, and again, this is not a free product. So again, don't don't. <laughs> there there are other tools out there if you need a need a three a free kind of uh, API portal. But this is the one we're going to walk through. Uh, so this is my portal, and I've got again I've got this already created and it's already wired up. So it actually has a URL, and you can actually probably navigate it to yourself. Uh, it's public. So let's go and take a quick look at it. All right, so this is kind of, this is actually Redocly's sample API portal. So it has a bunch of stuff that they've already put in, things like uh, training exercises and things like these, uh, you know, how to use their portal, how, how to create decent markdown files, that kind of stuff. But really what I show, want to show you is our, is our reference documents, right? So once again, here we have not just our specs, but we also have the ability to kind of post, you know, normal normal long form markdown content. Uh, we've got things like mermaid diagram support, if you're familiar with mermaid. Um, you know, and we've got kind of, you know, customized, customized layout here. So we can add all the kind of supporting documents that goes with, you know, using and consuming our APIs, as well as the references themselves. And again, how you structure this, uh, you know, it's completely down to you. Um, you know, you can, you know, I've got an example here of how silly you can get with it if you really want to. Uh, we've actually already got our two demo APIs already published up here, right? So if we click here, you'll see, any, you know, similar to what we had earlier, these are our reference um, documents. Uh, and also, you know, like I said, we've got a little more, a little more detail we can call out here. Uh, things like authentication, uh, long form, you know, that kind of stuff there. And so, what I want to do, I'm going to go through and kind of add our kind of third, third API, the one we just worked on. So let's go ahead and pull up if I can. Let's go pull up our Visit Studio code. All right, so. Uh, so here we have what's called a uh, site config. Now, I am going to need to grab the link for our demo API 3. So let's go back to our portal here. Let's go back to registry, I think. Maybe reference, I can never quite remember. Oops, I was right the first time. <laughs> All right, so demo API 3. Uh, we're just gonna copy the link there. And over here in our site config, we are going to add demo API 3, all right? And we're gonna go out and create a place for that in our sidebars file, which again, just kind of, you know, this will look familiar. This is kind of just a definition of, of what that sidebar looks like, how we, how we kind of organize all our data. So let's just go ahead and copy this one. Demo API 3. Probably need to go and create an actual open API page file here. Again, I'm just going to copy this for ease. And here I'm going to say, you know what, we don't, we probably don't need a curl support. And we probably want Go support. Let's do that there. All right. So we'll close that. Let's save that. And save that. Now I'm going to go ahead and commit that stuff to Git. And we'll go back quickly to our browser. All right. So let's go have a look at portals. And okay, so now this build can take a uh, fair amount of time. So I'll use the magic of uh, the magic of demos to kind of skip skip through some of that. Yep. So with a little bit of demo magic, this is now finished. So let's go back and if we click down on our portal here and give it a quick reload. All right, we've got our demo API three already published up here, and again, you know it. I think here we'll probably see a scripts endpoint. Yep. And 
script script ID endpoint. Again, we didn't update any of the other bits of the spec, so <laughs> the wording's not quite here. You'll also see that our code sample match uh, matched what we picked there. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how you know. And again, there's a lot of you know. I think I think the Azure the Azure API portal was open sourced uh, early this year. So if you need a a free kind of example, uh, you know, Microsoft has that API portal that you can just uh, clone from GitHub as well. Um, yeah, so I just want to walk past walk walk through kind of the 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 importance of a good good API kind of portal. And again, you know, I use the use the Twilio one uh, quite a lot as a, as, a, as a working example. It's probably one of the best uh, API portals out there these days. Uh, I think it's won awards. Uh, you know, and, and they have kind of one of their metrics is uh, what they call um, mean time to hello world. And it's really around how long it takes someone who's following their guides, following their docs to actually be able to get a text message the first time that says hello world, right? So, you know, they walk you through that very well. They've got lots of quick starts and helps help there. They've got your, you know, the API details and the reference stuff, and it's all all kind of nicely contained in this uh, fairly complex uh, developer portal. So, developer portals are an important place as you build out your API economy and as, as you scale upwards. So, definitely think about that. If you've only got a handful of APIs today, you might not see the um, the usefulness or the value from it. But you know, definitely as you start to scale enterprise wide, having a consolidated place where all this information and access is kind of contained is a, a super useful thing. So, I'll get you back uh, to the rest of the talk. All right, so moving on from that demo, let's go into some of the kind of pitfalls. Um, you know, and these are particular pitfalls that I've run into in the past, uh, building up building up this API economies. Uh, first thing is governance styles. Now, there's there's two ways to approach um, you know governance when it comes to standards and compliance, and, and that's what I call strong versus weak. So you think about a strong governance style is a very much more of a mandated approach, right? And it's like thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do this. Now, that's a good idea if you have a small number of teams and you have a strong authority model. And what what I mean by that is if you're in a position over all of those teams and it's not a huge amount of people, then you know strong governance can make a lot of sense because it's definitely going going to help you implement standardization very quickly. Uh, you know, the teams already are, uh, you know, already are used to you, your authority. And when you say something will get done, they're, you know, likely to do it. It can, however, cause some contention with team members, especially if they've got different opinions on how things should be done. And especially if you're not necessarily asking or seeking that opinion, you know, if you're kind of one of those ivory tower type you know, uh, architectural overhead type folks, you might, you know, you might get a little bit of grief from team members. So definitely source input on standards. Standards shouldn't be defined by one person or not even necessarily one team. Uh, you know, ideally you want you want input from all the people that are going to be participating in this economy to, to get a feel for things. Now, you can't make everybody happy. In fact, the chances are, you're, you know, uh, long term, you're never going to make every, you know anybody happy. <laughs> You've just got to do uh, what you can from a standardization perspective. Now, the other style is obviously the weak governance model. And that's more of a, you know, if you've got teams that say don't necessarily report up to you, maybe you're a, a center of excellence or something like that. So really, you kind of you advise and, and constrain rather than, you know, mandate. And so that's, you know, the weak model is definitely better for those large um, uh, disparate teams. And I just realized I got a typo there. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's going to take a lot more time for your um, standardization to take place. And some teams may just opt to never follow them, right? There's nothing to, to make them do that. So uh, one of the ways to kind of win those over in that kind of model is you really want to be uh, using your your time to show the benefits. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the ways we got a lot of early buy-in with our standards and stuff was saying, look, if you build your spec first, look at all the things we can do for you. We can create your documentation for you. We can scaffold out your your application for you. And all of that gets done very quickly, you know, without you having to dedicate time or resources. So, you know, if you can show people the reasons behind the decisions, right, that you're, you're likely to get a lot of buy-in. Also, it, you know, depending on your customer base and your stakeholder base, you know, there are customers in my org that generate a lot of revenue. So when they have input into whether our APIs are behaving good or bad, that input gets taken very seriously. So, you know, understand your customers and your downstream consumers, who who is using this platform and, and who, you know, and, and their input may, may help you steer standards and, and governance around like that, so... And then life guys, life cycle considerations. This is something that I think a lot of traditional app devs don't necessarily think about. APIs have a fairly different um, life cycle model to your traditional apps. You know, when when you're building web apps, you kind of own that experience end to end. So if you make an update or a change, you know that's on you. Right now, the, the users are just going to see it the next time they hit reload, and you know life goes on. 
Uh, going back to the APIs or a platform thing, other people are building on top of your APIs. So given that, you need to be very mindful of things like breaking changes. If you introduce a breaking change without telling anybody, without giving them the, a warning or a period to uh, you know, update their own systems, you're going to have very grumpy customers. Uh, and again, depending on your org, those customers could, be, uh, could have a, a fairly loud voice. So you know, definitely be mindful of breaking changes. Make sure that you have a clear communication uh, path for, for consumers. Make sure that they... You know, they understand what your sunset and depreciation uh, periods are or deprecation, whatever your, your preferred term. Uh, so understand what their expectations are. If they themselves have thousands of users using their tools, they're not likely to be happy with a one week sunset notification. Right. Um, so, again, be mindful that APIs are platforms. Uh, be mindful of, of what that life cycle is and, and understand that. You know, the life cycle of an API is, is more product-based than it is project-based. You know, tr uh, traditionally, a lot of developers, they come in, especially contractors, they come in, they do some work, they get paid, they leave. Uh, and, you know, we've had some APIs that have been built in that manner, and they get turned over to some team or some team that has no skin in the game. And you're left with an API that is no longer going to evolve. It's no longer going to get tweaked. Feature requests aren't going to happen. And you start getting a very stale API that people stop wanting to use they maybe maybe they're forced to use because there's no other option and, and that really kind of puts a dent in your customer satisfaction so uh, definitely be mindful of that you know treat your apis as products uh, think about that life cycle end to end um you know and plan for that when you when you start things off so I know there's a lot to cover in this talk. I know we, we kind of we kind of jump from place to place pretty quickly, and it is a really broad space when it comes to you know enterprise API economies. I mean, it's a, a skill set and a and a role all to itself for for most orgs. So hopefully you've uh, you've you kind of got a taste for what it takes for all the various different things. You know, we've we've talked about documentation, how important that is. We've talked about how to actually get that published and get people sharing that and get people consuming that. Um, we've talked about the importance of contracts and why, you know, when you're building an API economy, having stable, long-lived contracts uh, make a lot of sense for for your customers. And we've talked about how to, you know, make sure that those customer uh, those those contracts are, you know, well maintained and easy to consume. Okay, so again, uh, hopefully this is the start of your journey as you start, you know, kind of building up more and more automations, and as enterprises kind of go through their own kind of digital transformations and they start taking this kind of stuff more and more seriously. Uh, maybe you've kind of picked up on some other tools to, to help you move in that direction or, you know, hopefully uh, hopefully you enjoyed the talk one way or the other. So I think we're going to drop into a QA mode now. I'm not sure how that works because, you know, this is virtual now. So <laughs> um, I will see you overall in the QA section. Thank you so much.